Um, look, this is a really interesting subject tonight, the Palestinian crisis. Uh, will there ever be, and the Israeli crisis, will there ever be true peace and lasting peace? And I have to say this right from the outset, yes there will be. Yes, there will be. But it's not going to be as a result of mankind's involvement and intervention into this very complicated situation that has developed over there in the Middle East. Now, as with all wars, uh, there's no winners. There's generally losers so far, even though there's a, a ceasefire happening at the moment. They are saying it's a very delicate, sensitive ceasefire arrangement at the present moment of time. And by the way, there has been at least 30 rockets fired into Israel during this ceasefire, which is a lot less than they normally fire. Uh, but that's classified still as a ceasefire by, by Israel. Uh, but so far it's cost Israel $2.6 billion for a 50-day war that they had with Gaza and, of course, countless lives lost in Gaza and a lot less, of course, in Israel. Do we take sides as Christadelphians? No, we don't. Do we feel sorry for the innocent victims on both sides? Absolutely. Make no mistake about it. We're not here to, to wave the Israeli flag and say they're better than every other nation on the planet, therefore they deserve to win and so on and so forth. We're not here to do that. But we are here to see what the Bible says about such a conflict and we want to make sure that you understand, as far as Christadelphians are concerned, that we're not here to drum up support for Israel as such. But having said that, God is very clear as to which direction this conflict is going to end up. And that's what we want to have a look at uh, this evening because it is a complicated and complex um, set of circumstances that have developed over there in the Middle East. The first thing I want you to direct your attention to is this reading that's set before us. Psalm 83 is actually a prophecy and it's a prophecy about Israel's enemies that would surround them, the Arab states that would surround them and that they would have a charter, they would want a mission and that mission is outlined for us in verse 4. This is the mission and by the way all the nations that Ross had to read, sorry about that Ross, some of those names there, but all those nations, all those countries that Ross read for us in Psalm 83 are the immediate countries surrounding Israel. It's their ancient names but you can have a look at them and you can see exactly we're talking of the Arab nations around Israel. So their charter in verse 4, come on, let's all get together, they say. Let's cut Israel off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That is their endeavour. That is their charter. That's what they want to do. But they'll never succeed. Verse 18 tells us that this whole scenario is a catalyst, if you like. This whole psalm in verse 83 is a catalyst to draw even a greater threat to Israel, far greater than their immediate neighbours around them. The greatest threat to Israel is not the Arab nations around them, it's the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And we're not going down that track now, but we're just letting you know that Israel will have no problems, because God will be with them, to contain the threat from their immediate nations. It's just but a catalyst, verse 18, a catalyst to bring the whole world to the attention that God wants them to realise and understand. He wants them to realise and know that he is in control, that there is a God over all the earth. Verse 18, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Yahweh, and that's the correct translation in the Hebrew, art the most high over all the earth. So when you look at Psalm 83, you might say, this happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. No. Well, I guess in some ways it has. They've always had issues with their enemies right from when they were a nation in the Old Testament times. But as far as a prophecy is concerned, it will be ongoing until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can see in Psalm 83 a prophecy, if you like, that this is what we can expect. Now my phone's just gone into sleep mode, so that's uh, that's really good, isn't it? I should have. So I'm going to have to. Oh, let's just go by memory. I like this next slide anyway. Here's your Arab. Here's your Jew. Head to head, absolutely confronting each other. It's my land. No, it's my land. No, it is my land. Whose land is Israel's? Whose land is it? 
Exactly. I don't mind you answering these questions, by the way, because it gives me time to find the rest of my camera roll here and, and find the rest of my notes. Exactly, Lionel. Was that Lionel? Sounded very croaky, Lionel. Yes. <laughs> uh, exactly right, Lionel. It is God's land. And we know that from many passages in Scripture. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Deuteronomy 11 says God loves that land. He is watching it from year to year. Every day he is looking down at that land. Why would he be looking at that land? What's so special about that land? It is extremely special because that's the land he promised to the fathers, the faithful fathers of old. Um, in fact, God doesn't just own Israel. He owns the whole earth. You know, the earth is mine, says God, and the fullness thereof. I own the earth. It's mine. I've given it over to be... Uh, to mankind to be custodians of the earth. And wow, oh wow, have they messed up the planet. <laughs> We've really messed this planet up. The problems in the Middle East are man's problems. They are really difficult problems to, to resolve and to solve. But it's God's land and he says, I have given it to Israel. They've crossed over the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land that I'm giving you. I control, it's my land, but I'm giving it to you as custodians. That's what God is saying. So when we get to this complex situation uh, that we have here in, uh, in Psalm 83 and in the world today that it's spoken about, these terrible situation that has arisen between particularly Gaza, the, the innocent people, 1.2 million people in that particular area, fighting with the Israelis to try to obliterate Israel, we have extremists on both sides. And there on the left you can see the Israelis out there with his sign saying until all of Gaza is destroyed then the job's not done. He would be classified as an extremist. He just wants Israel to go in there and by the way they do have the power and might to do this. They have the power and the might to go in there and they could reduce Gaza and completely wipe out the whole place within 24 hours. They have the power to do that just in air power alone. And on the other side of course you've got the Hamas which is the ruling body, if you like, of the uh, Palestinians in Gaza who are saying, well, we're not going to give up. We're not giving up the fight. We're going to continue on until we've done our bit to destroy all of Israel. Well, that's not going to happen, according to Psalm 83 and many other passages. passages. It's just not going to happen. So the point we want to make is, yes, there are extremists on both sides and there are casualties on both sides. And your heart goes out to those terrible images that we saw of of innocent uh, civilians in, in, in Gaza that have been killed. Many of them forced to stay in their homes, in their schools, in their hospitals where the Hamas are basing their rockets, where they shoot their rockets from. You know, Israel is the only country in the world that when they fight a war, they do two preliminary things before they take out a target. They're the only country in the world to do this. The first thing they do is they drop leaflets on the area. So leaflets come fluttering down and I'm talking thousands, tens and tens of thousands of leaflets come fluttering down into the area they're going to bomb which says you've got 15 minutes to get out of your home. <coughs> if you don't get out of your home, we're going to bomb it. But they don't stop there. They then send what's called a dummy bomb. It's a loud burst of sound. They drop a bomb onto the area that doesn't do any damage. It just shatters windows and creates a terrible, terrible loud sound. And that's the five-minute warning. So they've given them 15 minutes, they've given them five minutes, and then they go in and, and level that area. They're the only army, navy, uh, Israeli defence forces, they're the only defence forces in the world that give two warnings before they're going to bomb an area. And yet the world comes down very heavily on them and says it's inappropriate, the, the behaviour that you're taking on Gaza. And we'll see in a moment that whilst it might seem one-sided, it's not Israel's making. They did not ask for this at all. And so what are we getting? We're getting the world opinion against Israel as a result of this whole scenario. So now they're trying to equate what is happening in Gaza to what has happened in South Africa for all those years, the apartheid situation. So they say on one side you've got the Wailing Wall, the apartheid wall, the, the border wall with Egypt and the biggest one, the wall of shame by the international media or the international community by turning their back on Gaza and turning their back on the whole situation. 
The reality is that Gaza was promised hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars by the international community to rebuild their city, to offer it as the mecca of the Mediterranean, like the Riviera of the Mediterranean, to attract tourism, to build an international airport, to become the new oasis of the Mediterranean. They've got some of the best beaches that will rival even north of Tel Aviv. The best beaches in the world are right there smack bang outside Gaza. They were offered hundreds of billions of dollars to rebuild their whole city, to put international airport to attract tourists if they would but just stop their hatred for, for Israel. Hamas wouldn't have a bar of it. And unfortunately they rule the majority of the people. So the world of course is now seeing these, these images and they're blaming Israel. They're saying it's all South African apartheid all over again. Uh, they're painting Benjamin Netanyahu up as, a, as one minute saying he wants peace and he's you know, bombing Gaza. On the other, other hand he's building these uh, um, settlements on the West Bank area which is causing concerns for the Palestinians on that side of, of Israel. So you see it's an ongoing battle as far as Israel is concerned. John Kerry goes over there, the Secretary of State, equivalent to our Foreign Minister, and he thinks he's going to have a, a, an input into this. So he gets down there. He, he actually made quite a mess of things. Benjamin Netanyahu couldn't wait to get him out of the country. He was saying, why don't you meet halfway on a lot of these issues? Well, there's only, the only halfway issue here is that the Hamas says... Death to all Jews. You want to meet halfway on that? I mean, this is the problem Israel are faced with. They are really faced with this battle, uphill battle, and it is, it is very complicated. It's very simple in, its, in understanding it, but it's very complicated to try and see the outcome of it. So how do we ever get from Palestine to Israel? Well, there's four main stages in which we got from the land of Palestine to the land of Israel today. Let's just go back to the first stage in 1946. This is prior to Israel becoming a nation. In 1946 there were smatterings of Jews in the land of Palestine. That's the white areas you see there on the map. They enjoyed an, an amazing, wonderful peace with all of their Arab neighbours. They got on famously well. There was not an issue. Many of them still generations later are great friends. There are many Arabs that live in Israel. There are Arabs that live in Israel that vote in Israeli politics. There are Arabs in Israel, they don't have to, they're not forced by nature, but they actually fight in the Israeli Defence Forces. They got on famously well. It was all the other Arab nations around Israel that complicated matters and said we don't want the Jews in that land. Well, of course, in 1947, the United Nations took a vote in November 1947 as to whether or not they would allow Israel to come back to this particular tract of land and call it their own. And the motion was passed. And that's the way they divvied up the land. So now the Jews could have all that white section and the Arabs could have the green section. Well, do you think the Arabs were happy with that? Not so much the internal Arabs, but the Arabs around the nation of Israel. And they stirred up the Arabs, a lot of them anyway, within Israel and said, we can't do this. The day, the day they announce their independence as a country, as a nation in their own right, will be the day we will push them all into the Mediterranean Sea, they said. And in May the 5th, 1948, they announced that they were a country, a nation in their own right, and that very day the Arabs attacked them. And Israel were way outnumbered, but they beat the, 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 uh, the Arab nations convincingly and by 1949 they had pushed uh, some of the West Bank area out, Gaza was still in its area there and they had taken a little bit of land, extra land. And they were happy with that, they were happy to live like that. 1956 came along, Abdul Nasser down in, in, in Egypt President of Egypt decided that he was going to have a go at, at wiping out the Jews and, and he had a good go at it called 1956 called the Suez Crisis. Didn't work. Reamassed his arms, his forces, got a lot of support from Russia. 
Russian engineers and military agents came down into Egypt. They trained the uh, military up in Egypt to have a full-on confrontation with Israel. But this time he convinced, Abdul Nasser convinced the surrounding other nations to also attack from the north and from the, from the east, from Jordan and Syria up in the north and Lebanon. And they, they were ready to attack. And of course we know the story. You may not know the story. It's a very interesting one. Israel preempted the attack. They had to. And as a result of that, they were able to push the Arab advancing nations back even further. They even took control right down there in the Sinai Peninsula. But now look at where the Jews are. So from Palestine and Israel in four stages, and there are smatterings, what they call occupied territories, on the West Bank. And of course, it's not occupied now, the Gaza area where Hamas has got a foothold, that's where the Palestinians have been relegated to at this point in time. So uh, we have an issue here uh, that we can see there is a major confrontation that is, has been brewing and developing since these wars started. 67, there was another major one in 1973, there was one in 1985, there's been small skirmishes ever since, to a war uh, with Gaza in 2008-2009 and now just recently the latest war. So it's ongoing. Will there ever really be true peace between the Palestinians and between Israel? How difficult it is to get our head around this? Well. Now, John, I'm going to ask you, because I've got a video clip here. Uh, some might say this video clip is a, uh, a little bit of pro-Israeli propaganda. It's actually given by a, a, a quite a, uh, an astute uh, lecturer in America and in three or four minutes he's going to explain to us the problem or the complexity, or not so much the complexity, the simplicity of the problem, the complexity of how to deal with it. It's quite a very interesting little video clip. I think you'll, you'll, it'll enlighten us a little bit more about this Israeli-Palestinian crisis. So, John, if I play this, is that going to start? Shall we give it a shot? There we go. When I did my graduate yeah. studies at the Middle East Institute at Columbia University's School of International Affairs, I took many courses on the question of the Middle East conflict. Semester after semester, we studied the Middle East conflict as if it was the most complex conflict in the world, when in fact, it is probably the easiest conflict in the world to explain. It may be the hardest to solve, but it is the easiest to explain. In a nutshell, it's this. One side wants the other side dead. Israel wants to exist as a Jewish state and to live in peace. Israel also recognizes the right of Palestinians to have their own state and to live in peace. The problem, however, is that most Palestinians and many other Muslims and Arabs do not recognize the right of the Jewish state of Israel to exist. This has been true since 1947, when the United Nations voted to divide the land called Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews accepted the United Nations partition, but no Arab or any other Muslim country accepted it. When British rule ended on May 15, 1948, the armies of all the neighboring Arab states, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Egypt, attacked the one-day-old state of Israel in order to destroy it. But to the world's surprise, the little Jewish state survived. Then it happened again. In 1967, the dictator of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, announced his plan, in his words, to destroy Israel. He placed Egyptian troops on Israel's border, and armies of surrounding Arab countries were also mobilized to attack. However, Israel preemptively attacked Egypt and Syria, Israel did not attack Jordan, and begged Jordan's king not to join the war. But he did. And only because of that did Israel take control of Jordanian land, specifically the West Bank of the Jordan River. Shortly after the war, the Arab states went to Khartoum, Sudan, and announced their famous three no's. No recognition, no peace, and no negotiations. What was Israel supposed to do? Well, one thing Israel did a little more than a decade later in 1978 was to give the entire Sinai Peninsula, an area of land bigger than Israel itself and with oil, back to Egypt because Egypt, under new leadership, 
signed a peace agreement with Israel. So Israel gave land for the promise of peace with Egypt, and it has always been willing to do the same thing with the Palestinians. All the Palestinians have ever had to do is recognize Israel as a Jewish state and promise to live in peace with it. But when Israel has proposed trading land for peace, as it did in 2000, when it agreed to give the Palestinians a sovereign state in more than 95% of the West Bank and all of Gaza, the Palestinian leadership rejected the offer and instead responded by sending waves of suicide terrorists into Israel. Meanwhile, Palestinian radio, television, and school curricula remain filled with glorification of terrorists, demonization of Jews, and the daily repeated message that Israel should cease to exist. So it's not hard to explain the Middle East dispute. One side wants the other dead. The motto of Hamas, the Palestinian rulers of Gaza, is we love death as much as the Jews love life. There are 22 Arab states in the world, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. There is one Jewish state in the world, and it is about the size of New Jersey. In fact, tiny El Salvador is larger than Israel. Finally, think about these two questions. If tomorrow Israel laid down its arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? And if the Arab countries around Israel laid down their arms and announced, we will fight no more, what would happen? In the first case, there would be an immediate destruction of the state of Israel and mass murder of its Jewish population. In the second case, there would be peace the next day. As I said at the outset, it is a simple problem to describe. One side wants the other dead. And if it didn't, there would be peace. Please remember this. There has never been a state in the geographic area known as Palestine that was not Jewish. Israel is the third Jewish state to exist in that area. There was never an Arab state, never a Palestinian state, never a Muslim or any other state. That's the issue. Why can't the one Jewish state the size of El Salvador be allowed to exist. That is the Middle East problem. I'm Dennis Prager. I think he does a pretty good job of summing it up. Uh, and I find that whole um, scenario there of, uh, of his uh, statements extremely, um, extremely good. Some might say it is a bit of propaganda. I think it's very sensible, makes a lot of sense to me. One side wants the other side dead. In fact, I really uh, quite thought his statement about um, at towards the end there that if all Palestinians and surrounding Arab nations lay down their weapons, there would be peace in the Middle East. And Israel's promised that. If you just recognise the fact that we're a nation, we won't, we won't need our IDF. We won't need to worry about attacking you or not attacking you, but defending ourselves, which in turn looks from the media's point of view that they're attacking with, with great force their, their neighbours that are around them. But if that happened, there would be peace. But, on the other hand, if Israel laid down their weapons... Uh, there would be no Israel. And, and that in itself um, is, is quite interesting because this is giving us, in a nutshell, as that presenter just said, the real complexity of this particular problem. Because the hatred that is so ingrained in the Palestinians, because they really think they've been hard done by, and they've been pushed and goaded by the Hamas leadership, is so great that unfortunately the hatred is building and building and building. How do you think the, uh, the Jews, uh, sorry, the uh, Palestinians in Gaza, how do you think they are feeling after the latest round of bombings that they have just endured? Do you think they're going to say, you know what, I think the Jews deserve to now be in existence? I I'm not that fussed about continuing on this war. I, I think they're not too bad a people. The hatred has only been elevated to another notch higher. So it's going around in circles and that hatred is building up and there just doesn't seem to be any uh, re resolution whatsoever. So here's a question. When did this problem begin between the Jews and the Palestinians? Does it go back to 1967, you reckon, Liam? Do you reckon it goes back even earlier than that? 
Who wants to tell me when you reckon it started? 1948? Any ideas? When do you reckon? How old's the problem? Bron? There we go. We have a very learned gentleman down the back there by the name of Brian Bennett that tells us it actually started with two very faithful uh, people of the Bible called Abraham and Sarah. It started with those two. Now, for those that aren't aware who Abraham and Sarah were, they are the father. Abraham is the father of both the Arabs and the Jews. God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a seed and that that seed would be great and God would work through that seed to bring about his plan and purpose with this earth. That was a promise given to Abraham. It was given to Sarah as well. The problem was... They were quite age. Sarah was beyond childbearing age and so she would sit there night after night after night saying, I can't have a baby, I'm never going to be able to have a baby. So she came up with her own plan and Abraham went along with it and basically said to Abraham, look, God's promised us a seed but perhaps it's, you, you, you may as well take my handmaid, Hagar, and, and we can produce the seed that God wants to work through, through Hagar. Now, there's no, you know, Abraham doesn't come and say, you can't do that, Sarah, that's a terrible thing. He can't, you just, that's, we, we've got to put our confidence and faith in God. There's, there's nothing in the scripture that even suggests that Abraham had said anything of the like. It was a mistake. And the Hagar and, and uh, Abraham um, had a child and that child was name was Ishmael. And Ishmael was a, a, a man of the field and... Sarah eventually had a child by the name of Isaac. So you've got two children coming from from Abraham. One of them, Ishmael, who's the descendants of the Arabs, and the other one, Isaac, the descendants of the Jews. Now which one is God going to work through? He's going to work through Isaac because he promised to take care of that situation. Abraham and Sarah made a mistake and they decided, we'll help you, God. We'll help you fulfil your plan and purpose. It was a mistake and it's been a mistake ever since. Now, did God cast Ishmael off and say, I'll destroy you right from the word go? No, he doesn't. He actually, when I say blessed Israel, he said Israel would become, uh, Ishmael would become a great nation, a great peoples. But he also said this about the descendants of Ishmael and this is most interesting. He said this about the descendants of Israel, that they would become, he says, like a, a wild man a wild ass, a donkey, in the sense that you're, you, you can't be tamed. Your hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live in hostility towards his brothers. Goodness me, if that is not a, 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 an extraordinary, um, um, accurate prophecy concerning the Arab race, I don't know what is. Right from their time and their, their conception, Ishmael fought with Isaac. Right from that that moment, the descendants of Ishmael fought with the descendants of Isaac. And right up until today, the Arabs are not only fighting against Israel, they're fighting against each other. Their hand would be hostile towards his own brothers, said God way back in Genesis. And you only got to have a look. You got, and this is just the main, uh, the different sects that are in, in, within the Arab race. You've got the Hamas versus Fatah versus Hezbollah versus ISIS versus Sunnis versus Shia versus Muslim Brotherhood. And you can break each one of those down into another subculture and they're all fighting each other. They can't get on with each other until there's a common enemy. And guess who that common, common enemy is? The whole lot of them are quite happy to forget their differences and unite to destroy Israel. They all hate Israel. And God said, that'll be the case. Psalm 83, you're going to take as your charter, verse 4. Come, let us cut them off as being a nation. Let's destroy them, that no one will ever remember them again. You want to know something? Psalm 83, verse 4, is pretty well the exact charter for Hamas. There's their charter. This is their charter. This is what they have written, as it were, in their constitution as to what their organisation is all about. 
Our struggle against the Jews is very great and very serious and we will eventually create an Islamic state of Palestine after we have obliterated Israel. That's Hamas's charter, Psalm 83 verse 4. That's what they want to do. Will they succeed? Absolutely not. They cannot succeed and God won't let, them hap- let that happen whatsoever. And there's a reason why. So if God or Israel is, is God's land, who has he given it to as custodians? Abraham had two children, Ishmael, Isaac. Why can't it be Ishmael's descendants' lands? Who did God work through to give that land as far as being custodians of that land is concerned? Who did he work through, Ishmael or Isaac? Well, the Bible is very, very clear as to who he worked through. And he worked through, of course, the descendants of Isaac. So he said to Abraham, first of all, lift up your eyes, Abraham. Look to the place where you are. And he was overlooking the the land of Israel at the time when these words were said to him. Look north, south, east and west. All that land that you see, I'm going to give it to you and to your offspring forever. Now at that point we can say, well, hang on a second, hang on a second. Ishmael was his offspring. Yes, that's right. But then who does God choose to, to ratify that promise? He goes to Isaac and he says, Sojourn in this land, Isaac, and I will be with you and will bless you to, and for to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands. Ishmael's nowhere in this particular promise. He's not seen in this promise at all. And then Isaac's son is Jacob. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. God is working through the nation of Israel through the Jews to bring about his plan and purpose and he's not about to let the descendants of Ishmael come in there and obliterate his people. It will not happen. In fact, when you look at Psalm 83, it's generally quite the opposite. Israel can quite well cope with the pressures of their immediate nations without any problem whatsoever. I like this little poster I happen to see. You know, what's another word for stability? The the other word for stability as far as the Middle East is concerned is Israel. They're the only stable nation in that whole region. Some of you may not be able to read that up the back, but it's a little bit old. But now 66 years of Israeli independence, 66 years of fair, peaceful, democratic elections, and 18 governments without one single coup. And every other surrounding nation that has descended basically from Ishmael have had many uprisings, have had many coups. There's no fair democratic processes in many occasions, but there is nothing but absolute chaos. God has planted his people in the Middle East to be a stable country. Ye are my witnesses, says God, that I exist. All the other nations around about are in absolute chaos. Have a look at the mess that they're in. Have a look. Have a look at the situation that has happened as a result of this Arab Spring. You know the West thought the Arab Spring was going to be absolutely marvellous. This is it. This is the, the pathway to true democracy in the Middle East. At long last, the people are going to rise up and they're going to take control of the situation and we're going to see a a far better Middle Eastern system. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Started, of course, right across on the western side of Africa in in places like Morocco and then it came across into, into Libya or Algeria, then it came into Libya, then look at what happened in Egypt, we've still got your problems down in Sudan and Ethiopia, uh, then of course uh, up there Lebanon's always had their crisis in, 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 in problems in, in all sorts of crises they've had to face, Syria, wow what an absolute bloodbath it is there, Iraq's an absolute mess, there's, been, there's nothing but a void there so guess who takes over? The minority group groups have, have taken a stranglehold and they've formed their own IS, Islamic State Brotherhood if you like and, and they are causing no end of, of, a, of concern for the whole world. Just announced 5 o'clock today on Australian news we're sending 600 troops, yep ground troops, over to Iraq to fight. No more of the air, air, air war, it's going to be troops. We're going to send troops in again to try and take on ISIS. 600 troops, what's that going to do? It's a drop in the bucket. But we've got to be seen 
to be making a stand against this Arab Spring that was going to be the greatest thing that the Middle East could experience. It's nothing but a mess. It is terrible. And when you look at Israel, the only stable country in that whole region, have a look at Israel versus the Arab lands. Israel is bordered by 22 hostile Arab nations, 640 times bigger than Israel. 65 times her population. Jewish population worldwide is 13 million. Muslim population worldwide is 2.1 billion. Wow. What a mess. What an absolute mess we have in the Middle East. It is absolutely dreadful. But God has said, you are my witnesses that I exist. I'm demonstrating to the world through you, Israel, you might be as small as El Salvador. Let's put it in context with Australia. It fits 367 times into Australia, Israel does. 367 times. That little country plonked there in the centre of the earth. All eyes are on it. The world is focused upon it because God says, yep, I've put them there and I want the rest of the world to scratch their head and think, what is going on here? I want them to ultimately realise that I do exist. And that's the whole plan and purpose of God. Behold, I am with you, he says, to save you, Israel. I might make all the full end of the nations around you, but I'm not going to make a full end of you. Don't be afraid, my servant Jacob. I am with you. Why is God doing this for Israel, to Israel? Why is he with them? Very important quotation. Ezekiel 36. I'm doing this, he says, for your sake, Israel, um, I'm doing this for your sake, Israel, but I'm not doing this, sorry, for your sake, Israel, but I'm doing it for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned amongst the nations. Now, that gives us a clue where we can quite clearly say, without a shadow of a doubt, that Israel is no better than any of the other nations around them, and in many cases, God believes they're worse. You think about it. Right from their inception as a nation, they continually turn their back on God, but God persevered with them. Right through their history of the Bible, they often just worship the most abhorrent idols that you could think of, but God stayed with them. Right up until the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, their own Messiah, they still turn their back on God and then they grab the Messiah, they grab the Son of God and they nailed him to a cross. They killed God's Son. God continued to stay with them. Yes, they were punished. Yes, they were dispersed in all corners of the earth by the Romans in AD 70. But God said, you know what, I've made promises. I'm not doing this for your sakes, Israel. I'm doing it for my holy name's sake. That is a reference to the fact that he's made promises and he's put his name to those promises. And those promises that he's kept, he will continue to keep. Unlike the promises made by many of the politicians, God's not like them. God keeps his promises. Keep this in mind, he says. Keep in mind that the Lord your God is the only God. He is the faithful God who keeps his promises. And he has promised that he will ultimately save Israel. And even if they are, in some cases, worse than the other nations, he will continue to be with them. These two here are not the best of friends, are they? Obama. Netanyahu, both leaders of their own countries. They've had their moments. There's only two people that have really, truly been able to stand up to President Obama. That man there is one of them. He has stood up, a man in charge of seven million people, population a little bit bigger than New South Wales. Imagine the New South Wales Premier, I don't even know who it is, but standing up to Obama and putting him in his place. Seven million people, that's all he's in charge of and he was able to put Obama in his place when it comes to matters of Middle Eastern policy, particularly Israeli policy. And the only other man that can stand up to President Obama is who? Vladimir Putin. He can certainly put President Obama in his place. But these two are not the best of friends because this man here on the left made a foolhardy comment uh, about two years ago when he said, look, to help um, solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem, Israel really has to resume to its pre-1967 borders. Now, of course, Netanyahu said, that's just totally ridiculous. We can't defend ourselves on pre-1967 borders. It's just not going to happen. 
Uh, I do have a little video clip here that will show you why it won't happen, but I'm going to stop it after a couple of minutes because it goes for about five minutes. We don't have the luxury to see it all. But it just gives you a little bit of an in indication as to why why we, they cannot go back to pre-1967 borders. Very, very interesting. Israel is a small state surrounded by Arab countries 650 times its size. This is of global terror. Only 44 miles separate between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. After the Six-Day War in 1967, when Israel was attacked by four armies on three fronts, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242 stated that Israel was entitled to new defensible borders to replace the previous fragile lines from which it was attacked. What are Israel's defensible borders? What are its essential security needs? The Jordan Rift Valley, Israel's eastern frontier, forms a natural barrier between Israel and the countries of Jordan, Iraq and Iran. The Jordan Valley rises from an area that is 1,200 feet below sea level to a hilly ridge of up to 3,000 feet, creating a steep 4,200 foot virtual wall opposite any force attacking from the east. The growing threat of global jihad activity near Israel's borders requires it to prevent infiltrations of terrorists and weapons. When Israel left the Philadelphia corridor in Gaza, it became a highway for the infiltration of terrorists and the flow of hundreds of tons of ammunition and weaponry from all over the Arab world, aimed at Israeli civilians. The Jordan Valley is the equivalent of Gaza's Philadelphia corridor in the West Bank. To defend itself, Israel must retain control over the Jordan Valley. This is Israel's mountain ridge, rising up to 3,000 feet. It dominates Israel's major coastal cities, where more than 70% of its population, 80% of its industry, and all of its airfields and seaports are located. Missiles launched from the Judean hills pose an immediate threat to Jerusalem, Israel's capital. Israel's only international airport, Ben Gurion, would be in the range of even primitive rockets while all planes taking off and landing would be threatened by shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles. More advanced weaponry would be able to hit virtually any point in Israel. If Israel were forced back to the 1949 armistice lines, the Green Line, the country's width would be reduced to a narrow nine-mile waistline that would be impossible to defend. That's why any future arrangement must include Israeli control over key areas of the mountain ridge and the demilitarized Palestinian state. All right, we'll leave it there because it does go on a little bit about some of the other areas. It makes you a little bit nervous if you're thinking of going to Israel at the moment. Uh, but, um, and we will be over there shortly, but anyway, it, it, is, uh, it, it is an amazing country to visit, but it's just totally different to what you could ever imagine being an Australian living in this country. You may recall when uh, we had our Israeli ambassador here to speak to us with all these security contingent, um, I think it was about 18 months ago now, uh, just before he went back to Israel, uh, he, um, he made a comment about life in Israel being very different to life here in Australia. And he said, didn't he, and it was really one of those moments where even on this carpet you could hear a pin drop and we had an absolutely packed hall. And he said, you know, when Australians have children, they bring them home from the hospital with basically a voucher that the government's going to give you $5,000, some baby bonus that you get when you have a child, $5,000 or whatever the amount is. He said, when my children were born in Israel, he said, the government gave us little gas masks to fit over their face. So in the event of a, a terror strike, particularly of, a, of a, some sort of a, uh, a bomb that would have these dangerous elements to them, that we'd have to put the little gas mask over our babies' faces so they would survive. And it just gave us a total insight of what life is like to live in Israel. Is it any wonder that they're going to go absolutely hammer and tong, if I can use those terms, to defend themselves against these insidious and ongoing uh, conflicts and resol uh, resolves by the Arabs to, to, to basically run them out of town. Who's going to resolve this issue? 
Who is going to resolve this ongoing conflict? And it is going to be ongoing. We're not, we haven't seen the last of it. It's probably going to build up to even a worse crisis amongst the immediate nations. It's all building up to the greatest climax this world has ever seen, which I think the whole world is just developing into this great fervour of a time of trouble such as never ever was since there was a nation, to use scriptural terms. Are you going to put your trust in these people here? Everyone in their own right have got some power and influence in certain elements of this world, whether it be the religious or the political or whatever. They are reasonably well-known, influential characters. The Bible says, and God tells us, don't put your trust in these people. He says, don't trust influential people, mortals who cannot really help you. They're not going to solve the issue. When they breathe their last breath, they return to the ground. On that day, all their plans come to an end. Some of them may have some good motives. I'm sure they'd love to have peace in the Middle East. But they will never, ever, ever be able to achieve their plans. Why is that? What is it about mankind that they can't seem to get it right? Jeremiah tells us, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Why is that? Because he says, The heart of man is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And of course God knows it and he knows exactly only all too well that the only person that doesn't fall into that category there who doesn't have a deceitful heart, who is not biased towards sin, especially now he's perfect, is only one person on this, on this planet that ever could lay claim to being a perfect man and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's he who will return to this earth and he will establish this um, planet and including the, the, the resolution of the crisis between Israel and Gaza, he will establish God's kingdom in the place of man's kingdom. And he asks us, and Paul uh, says this, or Acts 3, Peter actually says, Repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He's going to send Christ. Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth the heavens will receive him until the times of the restitution of all things which God has spoken about by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. And when that until time comes, he will send the Lord Jesus Christ back to solve the issues of Psalm 83 and to solve all the other world issues that we have here today. Jerusalem is going to be one day a city of peace. Psalm 102 says, Thou shalt arise, have mercy on Zion, for the set time to favour her, yea, the set time is coming. It's not far away. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. You know what Jerusalem means? It means city of peace. Apart from a 40 year, 40 year time span in the history of Jerusalem at the time of Solomon apart from that small 40 year period when they did indeed experience peace Jerusalem has been anything but a city of peace it's been a city of war and bloodshed and turmoil and continues to be even today and the whole land is embroiled in this ongoing conflict with its neighbours simply because it's not in man that walks to direct his steps. I'm going to leave you with, and some of you will remember this, I, I found it quite moving, it only goes for a couple of minutes, but it's really quite interesting. You might remember the first Israeli speaker we ever had here was Dor Shapira from the Israeli embassy, and it was not, it's, that was in 2006, can you believe that? It's eight years ago. 2006 he came here, and he left us with a little um, interesting slide presentation about uh, a, a photographer or a, a person that went to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, to witness what was going on at the Western Wall. Now for all our young ones here, not too many of them, but the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall is a very significant place in Jerusalem where people go, particularly obviously Jews and some Christians go there as well, and where they pray to God. They think it's quite significant to do this and they write little prayers on pieces of paper and they stick it in the cracks of the wall and they are hoping that God is going to answer their prayers for them. 
And it's an ongoing event, it's been going on, especially probably for a multitude of years, but particularly since Israel took control of, of uh, Jerusalem in 1967. And it's a very, very significant place. Anyway, this photographer went down there, or he had his camera with him, I'm not sure if he was just going down there especially to film anything in particular, but he just noticed a little boy writing a prayer down on a piece of paper and he was going to put it in the wailing wall and the photographer decided that he wanted to know what was on that piece of paper he was writing. So he asked his dad, is it all right if I just take some photos? And his dad said, that's fine. So I'll leave you with this because I think it's quite, uh, quite moving and quite good and it's, it's going to be the answer to this little boy's prayer that he writes on this piece of paper is going to be a reality. Not by man's doing, it's going to be a reality because God is going to intervene and send his son back. And we're not going to see any more these horrible rockets and these terrible images that we quite often see of innocent people in, in, in these wars that are taking place, not just in Israel, not just in Gaza, but all over the world. It's going to end. Christ will return and make everything right. So, again, John, we might need a bit of volume with this. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you, all right? to know what does the word Christadelphia mean. It simply means brethren of Christ and we believe that if you want to be a true follower of Christ you really need to know what this book, the Holy Bible, really does teach and we would love to have the opportunity to show you what the Christadelphians believe and how it is based on this Bible. We get very excited about the Bible because it foretells uh, the future in such accurate uh, detail, particularly Bible prophecy. And we believe the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is very soon to happen on the face of this earth, particularly when you look at the prophecies regarding the nation of Israel and Russia and Europe and other nations. You'll be fascinated to know what this Bible really does teach about what is going on in our earth today. Um, we would encourage you to have a look at this website that we've put together for you. Uh, it uh, shows you all about the Christadelphians, what we believe, and also what this Bible really does teach. 
Uh, Christadelphians are what we call a lay movement. That is, nobody gets paid anything. So we're not on a recruitment drive whatsoever to get more Christadelphians. We simply want you to understand what this book really does teach and have the opportunity to search out the matter for yourself. So enjoy our website. It talks all about uh, the Bible. It talks about our beliefs. And it even has uh, some of the seminars that we, we do quite often in our halls. So uh, enjoy it. And uh, if you need to contact us at any time, please do so through the website and uh, we would be only too pleased to, uh, to be able to talk to you further about these important matters. Thank you very much.